we have two presenters, uh, Bryce Richardson, uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in spring 2023 with bachelor's degree in geography and sociology. He now works as an associate regional planner for East Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission in the Appleton, Wisconsin area, while also collaborating on a GIS water quality study at the UW-Madison Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology. William Hope, who's not here with us today, but is a co-author on this project, is a University of Wisconsin-Madison graduate receiving a bachelor's degree in geography and environmental studies. Originally from Chicago, he's currently living in Boston and is working for the National Park Service. Also with us today is Eli Ganong, who graduated with a bachelor's degree in GIS and environmental studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He currently works as a sustainability associate at PwC in San Francisco. Oh, that might mean you're on Pacific time. And you can take it away. All right, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bryce um, and this is Eli with us. Um, our topic of presentation today is artificial photosynthesis and its application for hydrogen fuel production. Um, looking over the feasibility of such technology and then the siting of it as well. Uh, next slide. So our research questions uh, encompass two different modules. The first module was a feasibility study. Um, the second was a GIS site suitability analysis. Um, and so informing the first module um, our research question is, is it feasible to scale artificial photosynthesis technology as a method of hydrogen, hydrogen fuel production in the state of Wisconsin? And then looking at the potential challenges and opportunities that are involved with that. Um, and then also for the GIS site suitability analysis, narrowing it into which locations would be the most suitable for the placement of hydrogen fuel stations connected to these artificial photosynthesis units. Um, and so from a visualization perspective, you can kind of it as a Venn diagram um, where artificial photosynthesis has one circle. Um, artificial photosynthesis can produce many different products, um, but hydrogen fuel um, is one of them. And then on the other circle, you can think of hydrogen fuel production, Hydrogen fuel can be produced from a couple different um, methodologies, um, one of which is artificial photosynthesis. And so our project is focused to right where those two circles meet, um, applying artificial photosynthesis technology for hydrogen fuel production. Uh, you can hop to the next slide. And this will just provide a little context to the two-part research question. Um, so we focused on two scales, of course, statewide within Wisconsin, uh, and then at a city level in Madison. Um, kind of some relevant data layers we pulled in uh, was from the Department of Transit. This is vehicle miles traveled. That was looking at within the state of Wisconsin on the public road network, how many uh, vehicle miles were traveled in certain areas, which played into siting of these fuel stations. Um, we also looked at the shape file of the road network itself. Uh, that played into generation facilities. Um, and then the graph shown on the bottom left, a little chart, shows these fuel stations, which were um, the viable sites that we selected from because we wanted to kind of co-locate existing, um, whether that's legacy natural gas uh, pipelines or these like, generation facilities shown here down in that black and white picture. Um, but what that chart shows is still the majority are fossil fuels, but we are Kind of shifting towards a larger number of these electric or uh, biodiesel ethanol um, fuel stations that we chose to kind of link our artificial photosynthesis hydrogen uh, sites to. Next slide. Uh, so looking at our theoretical framework, um, so the process of photosynthesis um, seeks to biomimic natural photosynthesis. Um, so producing a variety of products. I mean, obviously natural photosynthesis um, combines water and carbon dioxide to produce glucose um, and oxygen. Um, so that is separated into two different steps. Um, the light dependent reaction, um, which splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and then the 
light independent reaction, uh, which happens at photosystem one and is the Calvin cycle. Um, that's where CO2 is in, uh, invested um, into the reaction and uh, where it's able to produce glucose um, in a natural system. Um, artificial photosynthesis technology can use um, alternate chemical reactions to produce other products, um, such as fertilizers um, and even consumer packaged goods um, from using this uh, biomimicry process. Um, but our project is focused solely on the production of hydrogen fuel from this, um, which largely is based on the uh, reaction at photosystem two or the first part of that uh, process, which is light dependent. Um, on the right side of the screen here, you can see the photoelectrochemical cell um, that typically is uh, a prime example of, of the type of technology and the type of process um, that's run in artificial photosynthesis production of hydrogen fuel. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there are two different ways that you can power um, hydrogen cars. You can do it with hydrogen gas, um, which is a little bit more volatile, um, as you can imagine, um, but there is uh, protective tanks and um, valves that live up to uh, certain constraints um, and that make it safe and viable. Um, you can also convert the hydrogen to hydrogen peroxide and run it through um, that way uh, in a typical hydrogen powered car with a hydrogen fuel cell. Hydrogen fuel and oxygen are sent through a hydrogen fuel stack where electricity is produced um, through their combination and um, ends up powering the car that way. Um, we'll hop a little bit more into um, some of the different types of like automobile like configurations in like the in the next couple slides here. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so Bryce kind of unpacked the artificial photosynthesis process and then the fuels that it produces. Uh, this sort of unpacks these key concepts for those two things to come into play. Um, so how does this fuel get delivered to customers and within a network? Um, we uncovered that there are a lot of changes that have to be made. Um, there is political support to varying levels, uh, of course, with the Green New Deal and new investment in hydrogen and alternative fuels. Um, but that also comes with infrastructure change, uh, things that don't exist, or converting uh, old infrastructure to be adapted to these new hydrogen pipelines or fuel cells or generation facilities. Um, but there is increased interest uh, in this hydrogen economy, so to be called, due to, of course, climate change and just shifting away from carbon intensive fuels. Um, and then this last bullet is kind of key to, to not only our siting exercise, but these key concepts of the sector coupling. Um, so it's less uh, costly and can be developed quicker if you use these legacy uh, pipelines or ships or um, fuel stations to kind of uh, deliver these hydrogen fuels. Next slide. So our literature review was divided into three different categories, um, given that this is a pretty novel um, combination of applying artificial photosynthesis technology to hydrogen fuel production. So we'll highlight um, some of the literature on each of those respective um, categories of, of existing research. And then our final um, literature review section is on the actual site suitability like characteristics and criteria um, that we used um, and were used to inform our JS analysis. Next slide. So the first component um, on artificial photosynthesis, there are three areas um, that have received a lot of research as of late. Um, most of the photosynthetic process is pretty well understood um, at this point in time um, from a pro like a process perspective. Um, but where there's a lot of opportunity for advancement and under increased understanding is at the um, molecular level. Um, and so there are three different areas specific to biomimicked um, artificial photosynthesis research light absorption and light harvesting, finding out how to make solar cells um, more efficient and be able to capture more energy to be able to use in this process. Um, the second is transportation. Um, and so that's transportation from the 
solar harvester areas to the uh, place where the chemical reaction occurs, and then also shortening, seeking to shorten the distance between um, photosystem two and photosystem one, um, and that ends up resulting in greater efficiencies as well. Um, and then the third area is focusing on using catalysts in the dark reaction. Currently, um, there's a lot of rare earth metals that are used in this process, um, but there's a lot of innovation seeking to use other material, biological, and molecular catalysts um, to be able to reduce costs and um, have more uh, renewable sources of catalysts there. Um, as I said before, there's many different products that can be produced, including hydrogen fuels, consumer packaged goods, and fertilizers. Um, and so it's a really cool, um, promising field. Uh, next slide. Uh, for our second category of uh, the hydrogen fuel research, um, so there's existing cars that do utilize hydrogen fuel cells. Um, you can see a picture of the Toyota Mirai. Um, that's perhaps the most well-known and, and best received one so far. Um, as of now, the upfront cost is pretty expensive, um, but the lifetime cost of hydrogen powered vehicles is actually feasible and uh, pretty attractive. Um, it, by using hydrogen and produced in this way, it results in energy independence um, and it contributes to um, you know, a shift towards renewable energies. Um, there is kind of a cat and mouse game sort of going on right now um, between buyers who are deterred from purchasing these vehicles because of a lack of network, and then also the industry being reluctant to establish a network um, with a lack of cars on the road. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty um, integral to um, the actual like production of these vehicles to be able to push uh, the establishment of a network. Um, and then again, uh, kind of highlighting the two different um, types, the hydrogen fuel combustion engines that run on hydrogen peroxide, and then the hydrogen fuel cell, which run uh, more on a, an electrical style car. Uh, next slide. So then the last component of our literature review was the siting portion of these fuel stations. Um, this is where we wanted to kind of better inform the variables we were using, the data layers, uh, as well as the, the kind of thresholds and cutoffs we'd be using for selecting what would be a suitable site or not. Um, we pulled a lot from literature that was uh, focused on like electric fuel stations and these fuel corridors that the Department of Transit uh, worked on developing so that you could connect city to city um, or within state um, interstate highways. Uh, and we kind of matched the criteria that they use for creating these electric stations uh, to, to hydrogen stations. Um, we also looked at things like demand. Um, that's, of course, getting to the point uh, Bryce brought up about you need to have uh, the cars within the network to, to uptake the fuel. Uh, we also looked at economic data, population data, um, and a few other aspects that we'll get to in the next couple of slides uh, detailing our methods. Uh, so we used a mixed method approach for this. Our first uh, method was doing in-depth interviews with individuals in academia and government. Um, we sought to uh, include individuals in industry as well, um, but understandably, um, they were reluctant to share views and perspectives on their own proprietary technology, um, and they sought to you know keep their uh, innovations to themselves. Um, and so in it, uh, to an alternative that we used instead of that was looking at news articles and industry reports in addition to legislation. And so that informed a lot of um, our site suitability analysis constraints and characteristics. Um, and it also informed um, a lot of what we discussed um, in terms of innovation on the, uh, the previous slides as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, this details the methods behind the site suitability. Um, on top, you have the statewide process and the variables that went into that, as well as the citywide in Madison. Uh, there's a few differences. The statewide um, site suitability used hydrogen fuel generation at these centralized facilities, um, as, as well as a place to, to, to fill up on site. Versus in Madison, we went the model of 
offsite generation facility with the distribution just at a single um, pump or connection. So what caused, that's, that's primarily what caused the differences in say selecting by census district um, to look for areas of low density versus in a Madison level citywide, you want areas with high density, high car traffic. That's that second variable there, um, which we used a data set that was updated, I think weekly with some um, traffic data so that we wanted to place these say, off of highways or within busy intersections that would get a lot of use. Uh, the first variable that occurred on both statewide and city was this pipeline factor so that you could convert these old uh, natural gas pipes to flow with hydrogen from the generation facility. Um, that was uh, uh, a variable we decided to, to pull in first just because of the cost savings it would provide. So we wanted to right off the bat exclude any possible sites that would be too far out of network. Um, even if they fit other criteria, just the cost savings that came from the coupling with legacy infrastructure was, was too beneficial. Um, and then we ranked these criteria. Uh, we did think about kind of providing certain variables with uh, more of a weighting, but just at the first pass of this, we figured that we wanted to identify just a broad set of these potential sites, uh, which are shown on the next slide. These are some of the outputs, uh, some maps showing the different variables. So the blue the rectangle shows that statewide and then green is the city level. Uh, so across Wisconsin, we started, of course, with all power plants. Those are existing facilities that would kind of take over production of uh, hydrogen from this artificial photosynthesis technology. Moving on, we overlaid those natural gas pipelines. Moving on, we used the census layer. Uh, rank those, and then we did a buffer around those selected sites down in the, the left uh, frame of the series, where we counted the number of these alternative fuel stations that could be sent out from that network um, to be provided with hydrogen fuel. And that yielded, uh, we, we selected 10 of these um, most viable sites, uh, tended to be around, of course, these highly populated areas uh, within Madison, Fox River area, um, as well as a few areas not shown in this inset map. And then looking over on the green uh, side of things, this Madison level, we started instead with alternative fuel stations instead of the power plants, um, then overlaid those natural gas pipelines, which did sort of limit the placement of these because the, the pipelines didn't extend, or at least the major pipelines didn't extend uh, far into this, the core of the city. And then one caveat to that that Bryce is going to bring up is there's a certain level of granularity that we couldn't get out of some of these natural gas pipeline data sets just due to the uh, sensitive nature of Genie not wanting to release a street by street map of where their natural gas pipelines are. So we had to do our best with what we had. And the last two frames, uh, that's that traffic volume, those intersections where a lot of cars are flowing through yielding uh, the top 10 sites kind of centered in the south um, and northeast of the city. Uh, so there were a couple of limitations um, that I'll briefly bring up. Um, one was a condensed project timeline. Um, this is our geography capstone project. And so we ended up fitting all of this into one semester. Um, and I think uh, this could definitely benefit from future research um, on a more extended and in-depth timeframe. Um, the second was uh, that limitation of not being able to interview people in industry um, and having to use a proxy for that. Um, and then, as Eli mentioned, there was a, a little bit of data limitations as well. Um, you can hop to the next slide. Um, we feel there's a lot of potential uh, direction for future research. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to expand on this foundation to achieve more robust results um, and apply this framework to uh, similar studies in other geographic areas, as well as other renewable energy technologies, um, and studying it from an economic geography and policy perspective. Um, that's something that we weren't able to really hit on in this study, um, but could be useful given um, the need for this um, policy framework um, going forward. And then also, uh, we'd like to advocate for growing interdisciplinary collaboration between not just like people in the social sciences, but people um, engaging with concepts in the chemical, physical, and biological sciences as well, and very, being very cross-discipline. Um, you can go to uh, the next slide. 
Yeah, so just super quickly, I know we're running out of time. Some of our key points is we did find that it was feasible, uh, just requires a lot of policy and infrastructure and suitable locations, of course, tend to be in those urban areas uh, mentioned below in the Fox area and uh, north and southeast of the city. So an acknowledgement on the next slide, and that's all. <laughs> I'm. I don't have a thumbtack next to me. I'm not sure if I'm if the audience can hear me or not. Hello. Ah, here we go. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we have a five minute break at this point, and then we start in on the lightning round. The lightning rounds or not lightning round? I call it. This isn't a game show. Uh, lightning talks, they start at uh, 20 after the hour, right? So we have five minutes. So uh, we do have a minute here if somebody wants to type in a, a question to the presenters. 